everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, tonight for our event with two of our most favorite authors on planet Earth, Lemony Snicket and Michelle T to celebrate Mr. Snicket's new book, Poison for Breakfast. My name is Evan Karp. I am the events manager for Booksmith. Uh, we're an independent bookstore and mainstay of San Francisco's Haight-Asbury district uh, since 1976. I think that's it for me. So without further ado, I am uh, very pleased to introduce tonight's stars. Michelle T is the author of over a dozen books, including multiple memoirs, a poetry collection, novels, and a young adult fantasy series, founder of the literary nonprofit Radar Productions, co-creator of Sister Spit, and the curator of Amethyst Editions, a collaboration with the Feminist Press. Lemony Snicket is the author of 13 volumes in a series of unfortunate events, several picture books, including The Dark and The Bad Mood and The Stick, and the books collectively titled All the Wrong Questions. Y'all show some love for Lemony and Michelle in the chat. And um, uh, Daniel, or, or, or shall I call you Mr. Snicket, <laughs> congratulations on the book. Michelle, uh, thank you so much for leading the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hello, Mr. Snicket. It's so wonderful to see you. Hello, Michelle T. It's lovely to see you. That just um, all the listing of events at Booksmith just like warmed the cockles of my heart such good stuff it's like really good stuff that's happening there and then it's like all these books are coming out all these people are like doing stuff it's a lot it's going inspirational. on yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, i'm always happy to be talking to you in private or in public michelle okay. team but okay. man you like booksmith you're both uh like uh such wondrous san francisco icons and so are you Aww. what a magical evening Mm -hmm. So listen, we're gonna like, what are we gonna do here? We're gonna answer, gonna help people. But that's the plan. We're gonna yeah. help people. So for, poison for breakfast is a book that's like philosophical in nature. Okay, that's what I want to know. I want to know like yeah. what tell me about your new book, please. Well, it was written during a beautiful stolen summer. Um Did you steal I, it um, uh, well, I, it, it was, uh, I got to steal it, I don't know, from, from the manic schedule of normal life. I thought I was going to spend um, all summer uh, in the city of Vancouver, uh, where they were filming um, for Netflix, a series of unfortunate events. They were beginning to film that, and I thought that was my whole summer plan. I thought I was going to, like, rent some place and, like, get up early in the morning and go and be exhausted and kind of alone, but kind of, like, full of the manic energy of doing that and then um as often happens with me and a, a giant multinational entertainment conglomerate they were like actually please leave and so i was so, i had a free summer i felt like i was 11. Oh That's what it felt like. yeah, i was like i got nothing because i said <laughs> to everybody i'm gonna be busy all day i'm not even ever gonna be able to talk to you yeah and so um i spent most of it in massachusetts and i had had this idea for a book that was inspired by various kind of small prickly inspirations. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure that it was a book, but I had this like window of time to just find out if it was. So I went to the library every day and I started writing this book of kind of philosophical investigation about things that were important to me, songs and movies and books and poems and about things that happened to me when I was young and things that happened in history that were interesting to me. And it kind of got folded into this murder mystery and it was like a magical summer. And um, then I had the first draft of the book and I use all the time something you said once, I, use it, I say it all the time, but mostly I say it to myself, is that you talk about the writing process, you gotta make a mess and then you gotta clean up. Yeah. You always say that. Mm -hmm. And um, I had never thought of it in just that uh, binary. And so I, Me. <laughs> yeah, right? that's, that's exactly what I think of with you. So strict about that stuff. And, um, and so that was the mess, right? That was like the manuscript of the, of, the, mm -hmm. of the magic summer. And then I put it away for a while. I used to put um, manuscripts away in the CRISPR of the refrigerator. Really? Yeah, I had a something, another children's author does that. And um, uh, I always had a feeling that like if the house burned down, it wouldn't, oh. it would be safe in the CRISPR. I don't know if that is true. Um, wow. And then my wife and I had a um, very um, quiet and methodical conversation about whether the CRISPR 
is for vegetables or whether it's for manuscripts and <laughs> about how important it is to eat, but also <laughs> to live with a writer. And so uh, she bought me a fireproof box. I now have a fireproof box where I keep my manuscripts when they're waiting. Oh my God, that's, you're so prudent. I love that. Yeah, that Lisa Brown is a good one. She's a yeah. good one. And so I put it in my fireproof box and then I took it out and I um, tidied it up. I made I, I had made the mess and so then I cleaned it up and then, uh, and here it is. And it is a different kind of Snicket book in many ways. It is yeah. less melodramatic, uh -huh. but it is um, more uh, uh, heartfelt maybe and philosophical. It has, I think, the most connections to the real world of any book that I've uh, made. And so I thought it would be interesting to take people's philosophical questions. And you're one of the best advice givers that I know. Thank you've given you. me advice. I know you've given countless other um, people advice, writers and activists, I think, particularly, who take so much inspiration from you. So I thought that would be a good thing to do tonight. This I got no other plans. Me neither. I mean, this is amazing. Yeah, this is a, this is like my best Monday night in a long time. So this uh, is like, I'm glad. yeah. All right. So well, I know people sent in questions through the magic of sending in questions. Who I can already see that these are some real doozies. Like that very first one. It's a it's a remarkably deep question, though. It, on the surface, it see it might seem trite, or who cares? Do you want to? Yeah. Well, you read it to me. I have them, but I wanted you to ask me them because I wanted to be as fresh and great as, okay. as possible. All right, so check this one out, okay? Right. The ramifications, I think you'll agree. When I eat out at a restaurant, should I order my favorite dish or should I try something new in the hopes of expanding my horizons? Oh, man. Yeah. Now, and now that I feel like restaurant eating has become so much more important, now that people are starting to do it again after a long mm -hmm. lapse, yeah it, it, it feels like a weightier deal it's really true yeah and like those 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 special dishes that that you love to eat at your favorite place like it's probably been so extra long since you've really gotten to scratch that itch yeah this does feel like a why not both thing because Ooh. sometimes the favorite dish is turns out to be the best thing and sometimes you have a new favorite dish yeah totally. yeah all I can think of, I don't know if you did this, but my kid was like a picky eater for a while. Yeah. And so we had a, a ritual on weekends. I would take Otto to his swim lesson and then we would go to a restaurant and he had to try something he'd never had before. And if he did, then we went to a bookstore and he got a book. And if he didn't, we went to a bookstore and he watched me get a book for myself. <laughs> no book. <laughs> And that's happened. diabolical because he couldn't the idea just the idea of that happening was so horrible for him yes. yeah and he tried everything oh my gosh did it did it change his palate I ask as a mother of a real picky six-year-old who like just wants to eat ramen and chicken to yeah I, the the big thing was umami which I feel which like a like a burnt up thing he really loved and the sweetness mm -hmm. of that of like a burnt thing I think was a door was a door in all right. Yeah. Wow. And it was mostly I, Asian stuff. We were mostly in the Richmond when we did it. And so it was mostly Asian restaurants. And to this day, that's where he's more adventurous about that. Like if I'm like, let's go to a Spanish restaurant and see what they got. He's like, let's, let's talk this over. Like, let's go to a Burmese restaurant and get everything. He's like, great, I'm in. It's oh my cool. God. I love it. Um, would, you, would you go to a favorite, like, I mean, I mean you live in LA, which is another great place. There must be like eight restaurants where there's like a thing that you need. Yeah, but honestly, you know, I, when I just visited San Francisco, I really had this whole like, oh my God, where am I going to go? I got to go to the places and eat the things, right? Yeah. So I went to Emmy Spaghetti Shack and it's like, I got the spaghetti and meatballs again, you yeah. know? But then when I went to Tartine, I said, you know something? It is, I maintain that it is the best chocolate croissant in the world. Like I couldn't find one better when I was in Paris, France. And I looked. I heard of that place. Yeah. yeah. So, so I did, I was like, what's this pie? Let's try it. Let's try the, let's try the, uh, let's not get the morning bun. Let's get the bread pudding. So, I but go. I did get the eclair. So <laughs> that was the both and. So I like that. It's like, yeah, yeah. Get, see if you can get, get a couple things because yeah. like you probably, you know, haven't eaten out in a million years. So it would be right. Yes, so. I'm going to go with that. Eat a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, that's good. That was great. Let's see what we got next here. Okay. I want to start a book review blog, but I don't know what to call it. What is a clever and witty title for a book blog? Is this a philosophical question? I think it is, maybe. All right, all right. What is a clever and witty title for a book blog? I mean, I would choose, I think a nice title in general is, is a phrase, mm -hmm. right? So I would, so if I were writing a book blog, which already kind of exhausts me to think about it then, <laughs> because it's exhausting. But I think I would choose like a phrase from something that I love. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that doesn't maybe particularly helpful to whoever is maybe listening. So I think I'm going to pick up, I have, I'm surrounded by books right now. So I think I'm going to pick up a book. Hmm, like a phrase. phrase. Would it be something kind of like book it? Like something kind of punny like that or on the No, note? I think it would be like a or phrase something you like. Like I got James Shiler here. Uh, let's see what we you got. could just do James Shiler poetry book blog title divination right now. You know what I mean? Just close your eyes, flip around, yeah. land on it. But how about like I just I opened randomly into a poem, which is letter poem number three, and it says, "The night is quiet as a kettle drum. The bullfrog basses tuning up." Quiet I mean, as a kettle drum. Quiet as a kettle drum. That's There's a your blog. Mm -hmm. Bullfrog basses. I think that's probably like. It's a better funk band name. Yeah. <laughs> but like you never know where your book review blog is going to take you before you know you're in a funk band. And then you just <laughs> this is the next line from the poem. So yes. So if that if that title doesn't please you, listener, you should take a book that you like and open it to a phrase. A method of fortune telling that I often use. Do you really? Bibliomancy. Yeah. Bibliomancy. Is, do, you yeah. have a, do you have a particular book that you feel like contains a lot of wisdom that you like to hit? No, I just think sometimes if I'm at a loss, I'll grab a book. You know, my desk is always strewn with books. My life is always strewn with books. Mm -hmm. so I'll just grab one, I'll open it at random. And it, it kind of rarely lets me down, I'll say. Oh, that's so great. Yeah. I love that you do that. Okay, let's see. All right. <laughs> Did you get to keep a spyglass from Netflix or any props? If yes, can you please send me a prop? Since I first saw the show, I really wanted a spyglass. LOL. <laughs> yeah, the um, the uh, when I was on the set, the temptation to steal was almost overwhelming. Really? I, I mean, it was, and I'm not a big uh, thief at all, but the but to stand and see everything wonderful was kind of overwhelming. So I did get some little things. I got some. Um, I have a great sign that is in the wide window episodes that warns you about leeches. There's a leeches sign, uh -huh. a couple other things like that. I don't have anything that I can send to someone, but I remember <laughs> thinking um, there's like, I want everything. I wanted to like go rent a U-Haul truck and come in in the middle of the night and steal everything. And but the I details for the show. It wasn't proper. Yeah, they're so good. And like, they they took, the, the those are props that came out of your brain, really. You know, it's yeah. like, it's not like random props. It's like, this is like your world that you created that they've then filled. Of course, you want to take it all. And to move to a more philosophical vein, perhaps. Yes, yes. Uh, I th what was exciting about working on that show was to meet a lot of people who normally had to do much more conservative things, both actors and designers and mm -hmm. costume makers and things like that. And particularly in Vancouver, a lot of them were local to Vancouver and um, so many things film in Vancouver. And I just remember one guy said, my normal time is that I have like eight sweaters that the cop is going to wear on his day off for the scene where he's at home with his troubled wife. And we just have to figure out like what sweater that is. And, and, you know, they're all urban outfitters or whatever, you know, they're not, nothing's exciting. Right. And here it was like, we're ever, you know, we never had a moment like that on the show where we said, yeah, we just need something regular that has to wear. It was always wacky. And so I've, I've taken that with me of the idea of that remembering, because sometimes when you collaborate, you feel like the collaboration is that you want to make sure everybody does what you want them to do. <laughs> that's not actually what collaboration is. Funny right. story. It's actually to, be, to try to get everybody to be excited to do what they want to do and do it together. Yeah. And I think trying to build solidarity out of enthusiasm is a good way to go. And that's a good lesson yeah. from that, I think. Oh, that's a beautiful story. Yeah, what a like what a gift to give some somebody like these artisans and like prop masters like 
just yeah. Do I just wandered around world. saying, "You're welcome." That's yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, um, Mr. Snicket, does your acquaintance, Mr. Handler, have any future plans for his play, Imaginary Comforts, or is it lost to the time hereafter? Oh, I don't know. Um, it's true that I wrote a play. Mm -hmm. um, it was kind of another that I wrote that play in another stolen moment. Um, mm -hmm. My father had just died and um, we had like a, a funeral, obviously, and things like that. And then I was alone for a little bit. My wife and child uh, went to the East Coast and my sister was visiting with them and things like that. And I was kind of I wanted to just kind of stick close to home and be just sad in my own space. Mm -hmm. And um, I wasn't working on anything, but then um, I, I know that you're like this too. If you decide not to work on anything, then you don't know what to do, you know? And so I, every day I, I got up and I would write a little, some little things and I didn't know what they were. And I didn't want to think, I did, and, um, and then they turned gradually into this play, Imaginary Comforts. And I had to tell my wife that I'd written a play my wife is not a big fan normally of the theater. And so <laughs> I, I kind of had to tell her that I wrote a play. Like I told her I had an affair. You know, I had to say like, I this thing happened while you were gone. You're going to be upset, but like, it's going to be okay. We're all going to work together and it's going to be okay. Um, and it was really fun to do it. And it's the, I, I, the, I mean, you've put on many, I don't think of you as a big theater thing, but I know you've put on a lot of events and there's that thing where the, there's something magical about them being temporary but also yeah. sad because you don't yeah. get to do it. So I wish the play was on kind of continuously so I could go on and see it whenever I wanted, but yeah. um, it's hard. But I'm working on more theater things and I hope that other people will, will perform imaginary comforts too. But it's uh, it's been a horrendous time for theater this COVID. Yeah, thing. yeah. Um, but you're working on more plays. That's very exciting. Yeah. I love, the, I love the, um, the freedom you give yourself to just be like, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. I'm just like writing the, some things down and then I love it. And then they cohere into what they're supposed to be. I like your process. I think it's good to, to I, I trick myself a yeah. lot. Um, yeah. So I tend to do that when I'm starting something too. Mm -hmm. I'll research it a lot. And then part of my brain will say, okay, there's only like eight more books you have to read. And then another part says like, I'm going to start now. Yeah. And then my first part's like, no, I, you can't start now. We, I, we agreed we were going to do more research. And I'm like, ah, you can't tell me what to do, self. Um, <laughs> And, but it's a way of tricking myself into starting so that I yeah. don't have to say, okay, you're already, it's time for sentence one of yeah. your masterwork. And instead yeah. I just do it, I just go and sneak and do it. And it feels I good. love it. I, I, I feel like I remember you saying once that like, basically like most research is just like, you're just procrastinating. Did you say that? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I think, you, you know, if you were writing something on the history of an uprising, say. Well, it, but for a creative writing, writing, for yeah. fiction and stuff like that. Yeah. I think I like to, I gather things that seem like they have something to do with it and I kind of mm -hmm. let them stew for a while, but then it's time to figure time out. To move on. To write. Yeah, yeah. I like that. All right. What is next? Okay. Why do bad things seem to happen all at once? Hmm. I don't know. You answer that one first. Why do bad things seem to happen all at once for Shelty? You know, I once said something sort of similar to this to an astrologer, a professional astrologer. And I was like, it's so weird. It's like, you know, everyone around me is also going through these terrible things. It just seems like a cavalcade of bad stuff. And it's like, the world must be ending what's going on in the planets. And what she said was that like, well, you, you know, have a particular astrological makeup and you likely gravitate to people with similar astrological makeups and something is happening for those planets and those, those, those signs. And so you kind of are all, all in it together and feeling, feeling that crush together. So okay. I, do, I don't know, but it's not quite the same. Although I, I do, I do wonder if it's astrology, because I'm just a little human here on earth grasping at the stars, like, like we've done since time immemorial, wondering why, 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 why is everything happening as it is? Why am I like this? Yeah. And is it like when, um, you, when someone uses a word and then you see the word everywhere, right? right. Something to that and that, um, 
I mean, I think it's part of the, the I, I don't know, I keep, I want to circle back to the book a little bit because here we are. Please but, do, please, as, I mean, much, as much. That when you're bewildered, it's a book about bewilderment. Okay. And when you're bewildered and when you're confused, I think that is when you are the closest you're ever going to get to understanding this world that we're on. And I try when I feel confused and like a deep confusion, you know, when I really don't know what's happening, I try to say that is in fact, you're stretching out now. Yeah. It's the closest you can get to understanding it. And that, you know, because we all know kind of mathematically that bad things and good things are happening almost continuously all over this planet. Right. Right. And that just because like you have a great Friday night and you hang out with friends and like, you know, you didn't spill anything. <laughs> and maybe you found a new item that pleases you or you had something delicious. You know that somewhere in the world, there is enormous suffering that is happening to an individual. Like, we yeah. all know this and you yeah. can't, you know, you're not going to be able to like mix yourself a drink and then make a waffle if you are thinking about only about the suffering that is going on. Right. But when you are suffering, when the suffering feels more um, visceral and more immediate, then mm -hmm. you think, I can't believe there's any happiness anywhere. But oh, all true. those things are both going on. Mm -hmm. so I don't know. I think it's that you're noticing them. But I don't know how you can stop noticing them when bad things are going on. It's hard to get out of a bad funk, I find. It is hard to get out of it. I like psychiatric meds, but that's me. I've always been from in the ocean. That's the thing. Yeah. Oh, I love that you do that. That is really nice. That is really nice. Um, yeah, you know, sometimes though, they're, they're really, they, they really do, the problems really do rain down all at once sometimes. And I think it is really true what you said about how like it can, it can make you stretch out. And what I like to think about too, is like, I always say this, like if somebody, you know, people, people get, get, they get sick you know, and they get really alarmed. They're like, I'm sick. Oh God, I'm sick. I got a cold. You know, I just, it's actually, it's very normal to be sick. Like you're, it's totally like our bodies are supposed to get sick. Like it's totally normal. Yeah. And, you know, with all due respect to all of the heinous suffering um, in the world, it seems like it's normal for us to be in pain. So there's gotta be something, there's gotta be something there to dig into. Yeah. There's yeah. gotta be something there to dig into. I don't feel like you go here a lot, but that was a very Jewish idea that you just did. Was it? Uh, so, mazel tov. Congratulations. Welcome to the tribe. I'm honored. I'm honored. Okay. What do we got next? Um, okay. Let me see. Are regrets that bad? <laughs> <laughs> I love the that. There's no, you can't say they're not bad in that. You're just, are they really that bad? Bad, you know? Um, <laughs> No, they're, I don't think they are actually. I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I've never, but maybe like, I'm, I'm thinking about my personal experience with of regret. I don't think they're that bad. I, I don't have any of, but maybe I just don't have, have any of the level of like staring out the window on a misty night, you know? Yeah, there's a little section in this book about something that I regret that haunts me, that really happens to me. Um, and it was that I was, um, I, I hailed a taxi cab and a taxi stopped and it was raining. And there was, and then I saw that it had actually stopped for like uh, other people and their baby. I know where this is going. But I just took it. A baby. A baby. Yeah, no. That yeah. baby could have been on its way to a shoot. And it I didn't. Had I, a, had a no, I had no good reason for taking it. And it's by. It's definitely not the worst thing I've ever done. But it. <laughs> but I think the absolute ease with which I did it. You know, I didn't do it with ignorance, uh -huh. and I didn't even do it with malice. But there was something about just that I just did it that somehow made it makes it worse when I think about it. And, um, and then when I think about it, I can never decide if I hope that they don't remember it at all, that no one remembers that. Or if I hope that they're every so often, they're like, oh, that guy, <laughs> like, what is the better? <laughs> So what did, did it trigger some soul searching? Like what was that cab ride like for you? 
it was, well, it happened so quickly, you know, yeah. and, then, and then and then just like then I was sitting in a cab thinking, there's I have no excuse. I can't possibly be like they don't know that I'm a surgeon and I'm rushing to save lives or you know or, or anything at all. I just was like it's raining and I don't want to be out in the rain anymore. Oh I'm man, not, that's bad. And so I think about it and. Um, and then also, I think that, you know, in a situation where you can't apologize, it's hard to do that too. Like there's nothing, there's nothing you, yeah. you, you can only try to maneuver it to make it okay in your head. You can't actually, you can't find them. What are you going to do? Yeah. And so you just have to say, and we've all done these things that's all, but there's something about the ease sometimes in which that happens that I think is, um, that I think that's scary to think about yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's kind of malice you might be able to work out. And ignorance, you hope you can get over. Yeah. But just like whatever the blank face of being selfish is harder, I think. Yeah. So was it that bad? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm in the space of regretting it now. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. It's, uh, but um, I feel for people who are, uh, who are wallowing in regret, who might be listening to this or anyone yeah. at this moment who might be doing it. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard to do that. It's a hard space to be in. All right, let's see. Um, Dear Mr. Snicket, is there a quote from any literary work that has kept your head afloat during this turbulent time of the pandemic? Oh gosh. I mean, the short answer would be that literature really kept me afloat a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I read a ton of poetry, particularly at the beginning where I felt like my attention span was really shattered. Mm -hmm. And um, and of course we were all like watching things on screens, of course, yeah. and, um, but, but I began to feel that kind of sick, awful feeling of like, please God, no more episodes of anything. Yeah. Um, but it was hard, that was, the, that was the easiest thing to do. But, um, but I found if I, could, I, if I sat and I would read one poem and then I would wait and I would read another poem, I could try to get into a space that felt a little better. Um, and I'm thinking I have all these, well, um, I'm, this is, I, it's not, it's gonna surprise almost nobody. But I have this on my desk, but I kept, but I hadn't had it on my desk for a long time. And then I put it back on my desk and it's, um, and I've been working with it again, but it's the flowers of evil, my Charles Baudelaire. It got you through the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> but there was something really, the, the, the sustained like um, anxiety and um, beauty that are hand in hand in Baudelaire's poetry is really marvelous. You know, he's mm -hmm. just, he walks around kind of sneering at the world. It's like everything's useless. You know, he's like, I mean, sometimes it's very specific about a class of people or a gender of people or anything like that. And that can be really hard to take. But often it's just like everything is horrible. Everything is yeah. horrible. And then he'll just be like, but then I just see a little thing and it possesses me. And I think that was, um, that really stuck with me. And um I'm um, I'm working on a new project now that is that started as kind of a return to thinking about Baudelaire, and I'm excited about that. Really? Well, yeah. I'm excited about that too. Oh. All right. Um, so not a quote, but not a quote. Yeah, of but, yeah, but um, yeah, but it was it'll as I say it'll surprise nobody that I recommend the poetry of Baudelaire. Mm -hmm. You heard it here first, kids. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I love this one. Where is the well of enthusiasm? How can we find it and know we'll find our way back the next time we search? Oh. Well of enthusiasm. I really like that. I like mm -hmm. the idea of the well of enthusiasm yeah. so much. Mm -hmm. um, Me too. And I think, and I, I, I often think that enthusiasm is the heart of the literary enterprise, of maybe the whole cultural enterprise. Um, and it's often forgotten. I think, particularly if you're kind of if you if you work in something which you're enthusiastic about, as mm -hmm. I do, you mm -hmm. can forget that that's what you get in it sometimes. And it's really yeah. important to remember that it's not, and you know, that it's made of enthusiasm. But where is it? I mean, I think you and I would agree on this. That I think it's like on the on the edges of things, on the fringes of 
um, culture and identity and yeah. um, livelihood yeah. and philosophy. Yeah. And, you know, I read a lot of stuff by, that are published by small presses. You know, nothing warms my heart more than if it's like, I know the artist stapled that chat book together I'm in, in a way that I'm not in, <laughs> in from like a corporate publisher, you know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm drawn to it, even though it's off, it's often terrible because most things are terrible, but, but I'm drawn, <laughs> I'm drawn to it. And, um, sometimes I think people say, oh, you're only reading this like offbeat thing that no one's reading to like show everybody that you're cool or something, but it's always like those ideas are, um, are they are they're going to be in the mainstream before you know it but you're yeah. going to discover it when they're really new and fresh mm -hmm. and I mean you are like a perfect poster child for that I mean when I met you you're like a like a scowling you know <laughs> you're like writing about a, a culture that I knew a little bit about because I lived kind of adjacent to it but I mean you were yeah. writing about like living in the mission in San Francisco as a lesbian Mm -hmm. like the early 90s and you know it's like now that that we're like we're in like a post portlandia space about <laughs> that kind of culture right now yeah but at the time that could literally not be found in literature yeah. that wasn't being stapled together by the people who are making it it's so true it's so true and everything that you're saying about small presses there is so much like optimism and hope and enthusiasm in all of those endeavors yeah. like young writers and like like you dare dream that you could actually complete a book you know and then you dared send it out someone dared read it they put it into the world somebody dare found it you know it's like it is really exciting other yeah. people i think is where the well the well of i almost said the well of loneliness <laughs> <laughs> different well totally yeah. different well the other Do well, not other well. yeah <laughs> <laughs> i think the well of enthusiasm is really it's other it's in other people if you're not feeling inspired yeah. go out and see something go to a, like a freaking drag show like i've had tears in my eyes and chills from the passion at like an intensity that like somebody has put into a lip sync, you know, like maybe I'm easily moved. I don't know, but just seeing, seeing people doing things, expressing themselves, like that's a, that's a hopeful and enthusiastic act. Absolutely. Yeah. And being there for them, being an, being an audience member, that's right. where enthusiasm is, right? Being, and being in the audience. That's. I would agree with I that. Think. Yeah. And to try to kind of shake up your own algorithm, right? We, yeah. I mean, all of us look, certainly pre-pandemic also we're all living so much on screen yeah. and then it really got heavy and it's like that's okay it's okay that like that's our our major thing and there's a lot of stuff that isn't up now there's not you know there are many people who are there's not a drag show is not accessible to them at this current moment in time but um you know when you go to youtube type in like prom fight and it'll start to shake up your algorithm <laughs> you'll start to see people doing goofy things instead of seeing like a trailer for something that's like the trailer for the other thing that you watch and that you're not going to watch, you know, try to, and, and I think about that all the time. I think about there's so much algorithm going on when we're participating yeah. digitally to try to just shake it's that So up. true. There's going to be such an uptick now in like prom fight searches, like the, the computers, the AI is going to be like, what happened? Yeah, what? that was not a random example. Let me tell you. you can have <laughs> oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. So you're endorsing prom fight. Okay, cool, cool. Very I'm not endorsing prom fight as a thing to do. Sure, sure. But yeah. for everybody it, have a good doing. prom. Have a good prom. Have a good safe prom. However, <laughs> if it doesn't work out and it's on camera and you'd like to see it, that's fun too. Yes. Oh yeah. my God. Okay, let me see. Um, I recently left a seven-year library job to pursue art full time. How Ooh. can I maintain a commitment to accessibility? and humanity in art when I also have to pay the bills with it. Mm. Impressive. First mm -hmm. of all, I'm digging yeah. the integrity behind this question. Of course, yeah. I have a deep love of libraries. This is Poison for Breakfast is probably my umpteenth love letter to libraries, but oh, and really this book is written almost entirely in libraries. And oh, I um, love it. such a magical thing I wrote as I said most of it in this library in Massachusetts but then um I did I did go to Vancouver some to mm -hmm. work, to work on it there and um and I had this like like crummy hotel I, crummy it sounds like it wasn't fancy because of course it was fancy because it was like Netflix was putting me in a hotel room mm -hmm. but it, just had, it was oppressive and um 
and then I would have time off and I wanted to work on my book and I was like where do I even go and then I remembered that I could go to a library yeah. I remember that recently in Copenhagen too and to go to a library where you don't live there yeah. is an even more magical space so sorry I got sidetracked no it's okay Ma libraries yeah. are magical spaces yeah, well, and um, growing up in San Francisco, San Francisco was the first library to um, library system to hire a full time social worker and to really understand the oh. job of public asset access and accessibility yeah. that this questioner is asking about. That that's a really, it's a large and wide and deep mission that isn't only like, hey, I got a book for you. And right. So um, I'm touched by. Um, by anyone who, who has that commitment. Yeah. How to bring it into your art, I don't know. I feel I probably have more to learn as an artist from a from someone who's been seven years in a library than I can tell them about how to move that. But um, but I but I think just the that that idea is in the brain that accessibility is so important to someone. I think it's really beautiful. I think so too. And I think that like art making comes at least in part, I mean, for me anyway, like it comes from such a deeply like um subconscious sort of place it's like it's so in the back rushing out and I just feel like if this is your obsession you know or something that's so deeply important to you it's in there and it's going to come through in your art in some way yeah it's meaningful it's just going to it's just it's just baked in to the psyche and I know we both started um in kind of the world of zines mm -hmm. um, when you were talking about the getting excited I was thinking about oh like I used to go to Kinko's to make my zine and like just walking into the Kinko's and then everybody was doing something, you know, they're like, I've got to, I'm working my wedding invitations. Like I'm working <laughs> placemats, I'm working on whatever I'm, you know, and you could see all of that action going on. And I, yeah. think, I think that a little homemade thing to accompany whatever kind of art you're doing, it's always, people always love it. And it's, and it's totally. Yeah. Oh, that's a good reminder. Yeah. You can always scale it back. You can always just like try to do both things, try to do the the paying the bills thing and then the just sort of like yeah. something for the people thing. I, I recently went to this website that I used a bunch of times and they stopped this deal that they had and and I felt responsible because I used the deal so much, which was that you have, I think it was 500 business cards printed for free. It was a free amount of business cards and it was a lot. Uh -huh. And it was because they had a little ad for their company on the back. Who cares? <laughs> and so, I, I mean, I used to send people those business cards. I used to, if I was like going to a party, I'd be like, oh, quick, 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 quick. I'm going to order those business cards and like bring them because you could put any kind of ridiculous slogan on them. Uh -huh. There was all this like bad clip art, you know, like when you used to get on your Yes. Oh, God. So yes. Because the bad clip art was really great. Um, yep. I always sent them to anybody who I knew who got laid off. I would send them business cards that would just be like Empress of China or whatever, you know, something yes. like a job just to make them feel better. So, mm -hmm. um, so I, normally I would recommend that, but I noticed that they stopped the deal. They were like oh, man. doing nothing but making joke business cards for free. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can't, this is not a workable model for us. But, um, but that's an example of like that you can make something really cheap and fun and give to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and that they love it. Yeah. Right. Um, let me see. I have a story to tell. How do I tell it? I have a person to save. How do I save her? Oof. No pressure. Yeah. Just, uh, the ultimate questions, just like really enormous. I mean, this is a, a writer's uh, prejudice for sure, but I mean, I do think s stories save people so much. Yeah. I think not only in literature, in literature but I think telling someone a story always can save them mm -hmm. you know when someone says this is the trouble that I'm in and you're able to say I know someone that happened to or this happened to me or mm -hmm. even I don't know if this makes sense but there's something I feel like I needed to tell you this four sentence story um and then to be an audience as you said for their yeah story you know yeah. um so I mean, I think that's how you tell a story is that you listen to other people's stories. Yeah. And I think we all save each other by telling each other these things. Yeah. 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 That was perfect. All right. Let me see. How do I cope? We're getting, we're getting real heavy here now. How do I cope with the existential dilemma that is climate change and my inevitable part in it? Or rather... What do you recommend doing to lift the spirits and take part in saving the planet despite all apparent futility? That's the real question at the end there. 
Oh, despite yeah. all apparent futility. That is. And um, uh, recently I've been uh, hanging out with, I know we both like her, uh, Lucy Corrin. Oh, love um, Lucy Corrin. Yeah, and she sent a new book out. Uh, yeah, it's out next month. And you cannot believe how good this book is. It's called oh. The Spank Hotel. It's coming out from Lucy Corrin. This is like a recommendation to everyone. It's a, it's a major, major, wonderful book. Um, but she is always, she, is th she thinks about the climate a lot. So sometimes it's, it can be a little bit of bummer theater if we get it, if we get into talking about what's going on. But I mean, the only thing I would say about that is that the only way we're going to get out of anything like that is solidarity. And, the, and you, I think we could all, I'm talking to myself as much as anyone else, but we could yeah. all try to build that more around us in our lives not necessarily about climate change but we will only reach solidarity but through through modeling it and if you are not engaged in the work of agreement and solidarity going on it's not we're all gonna go down quicker than we think we are even i think and it's hard it's mm -hmm. really hard it's really divisive times and it's really easy to say divisive times and to say divisive times by meaning like it's divisive on me like i don't feel you're not people aren't letting me do my thing that is the way in which it feels divisive and it, you have to remember that it's that's not you're not going to make it by saying people have to accept me you're going to make it by accepting people that you don't want to accept and it's really really hard that and, is harder maybe even than saving the planet yeah well it's the same thing i think yeah i think it's exactly as hard as doing it and um I try to think this a lot and I'm not very good at thinking of it, thinking it or believing it when I think it, but mm -hmm. I try to think a lot that everyone is doing the best that they can. And it's really hard to do that because you, your screen will show you an endless number of people yeah. who you want to think are doing the best that they can. And in fact, that the slogan for them is do better. <laughs> <laughs> But that actually, you know, that feeling you have when someone tells you to do better and you yeah. feel like, but I'm just really tired and busy right now and I don't <laughs> want to do better. <laughs> that is what the world is made of. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh my God. That's a good answer. It is in other people. The, the solutionary thing is other people. Yeah. Just remembering that they're there. Um, okay. I am a poet and just released my first poetry book. Brava! Yes. I've been wanting to write my own novel series for the longest time now, and I don't know where to start. I feel like every good series has been written. Any thoughts on how to get out of that fog or how to overcome writer's block? Hmm. Wow, I love that question. The mm -hmm. question was like, I just wrote a collection of poetry and I want to do another thing. Like, yeah. Can you help me out of the writer's block? I don't like, I'm not sure you need help with your writer's block. I think maybe someone needs to like maybe do your laundry, but um, because <laughs> you're working. You're having too many ideas. You can't do laundry when you're having yeah. so many ideas. That's been a I don't know. Where did you, you wrote a, you have written a lovely series about mermaids. Where did that come from? I mean, it came, it, you know, I just, I mean, yeah, I guess it's, it's like you got to figure out what you're going to write about, right? I guess I got really inspired by, um, the, I, you know, I'd read The Golden Compass, actually, after years of people telling me to read it. And I was like, oh, there's a girl ride, riding a flying polar bear on the cover. Like, it's not my jam. I don't like that kind of stuff. And then um, and then I was dating someone who loved it. So I read it because I was in love. And, um, and I was like, oh, wow, this is really cool. I really liked it. And I thought, what would, you know, thinking about the things that I'm really interested in, which is myself and where I come from, what would that look like if I gave it a, a magical infusion? Like, you know, there, you know, you can look at books where you're like, that's what the magical land looks like there. But like, what would my you know, this, this landscape that I'm so obsessed with writing about, what would it look like if I, if I put magic in it? And so that's kind of, that was kind of where I took off from, but, um, but, you know, for writers, so I, it seems like this person's having a hard time even getting started. Yeah. You like to do now you, I admire you and your process so much because you do outlines. Yeah. I do. I, I, it, you know, whenever anyone says outline in this context, and it just happened, my immediate visual is the chalk outline around a dead body in a crime drama. <laughs> oh my God. And, but I always feel like that is actually what I do. Yeah, it's not that far off. The broadest off. thing. And then it's not the whole story. Right. It's just some thing, but I know I want to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think... 
and I mean, I feel, it, well, anyway, I'm sure this poet already knows it, but, but I think a beautiful thing to do in life in your relationship to literature, and I think it really helps if you're trying to make literature, is to build your own canon. There's mm -hmm. so much um, uh, aesthetic and political and social argument about canonization in mm -hmm. culture and literature, and that's super important. There's a lot of manifestations of that art collides with capitalism and so there's art mm -hmm. getting funded and there's art not getting funded there's art being visible and not being visible and it's super important and I don't want to dismiss it I just think the primary we said before the primary relationship with art is enthusiasm mm -hmm. right and so the things that are important to you should be important to you mm -hmm. you know and and I always think when you're making a book the book is made out of all the books that you've read and you've loved and oh. you're going to steal these little little bits from mm -hmm. it and you're gonna remember this tiny little scene that you liked and you're gonna remember a character that's like, you don't even remember because you changed the character a little bit. You're gathering all this stuff from, I mean, not just literature, but a lot of literature that you loved. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you're starting a project, it's good to kind of gather what you think the canon yes. the project is. Yeah. And make it out of that. I think that's really a great thing to do and it's fun I do that also and it's very fun yeah and then just like pick a little book at random before I sit down to write and just open it up read a little bit get in the zone yeah and uh Andy Greer and I just started doing it together where he would be like I want to write a book that's like this and like this and so they're both on my desk but I want a little there's like a little thing over here and I don't even know why I'm being drawn to it but I'm being drawn to it and I think that that's the shape of that kind of a yeah. magpie aspect of it seems really crucial to me. Yeah, and also kind of along the lines of this, the idea, you know, the, the our, our querent um, said, you know, it seems like everything's already been written. I always think like, yeah, but like, just the way that, you know, a book is the, you know, it's sort of the culmination, like you said, of all these other books, of every book that you've read, all those books that are inside you. It's like, you know, your book that you write is going to be it's all your reference points, your singular reference points that you overlap with lots of people, but then no, you know, like family, cultural, the books you read, like it's all going to come out in a particular way and it's your way. And, and that's our, how the same yeah. story can be told. You can write a love story a gazillion, bazillion times again and again. You yeah. can, you know, that some sort of classic tale, like they can keep getting told because and that's how, our, is that's how our hunger works for things, I think. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think people say, well, there's already been a bunch of good love songs, so I don't want to hear, any, hear any more. Yeah. I'm all done with that. I feel no. that part permanently. Yeah, yeah. I don't um, want to hear nothing poignant anymore. And one of the joys of writing this book was mm -hmm. I write about this movie, um, Midnight, that has these uh, twists in the story that are super interesting to me. I write about this Nina Simone song that... Um, I has always kind of affected me profoundly and made me Which think. Which one? Uh, What's well, Sinner Man? It's a very long song, mm -hmm. um, but I guess. But, but the part that I write about in here and the part that I like so much talks about. Um, there's a verse that says like, I, um, and so I went to the Lord and I said like, Will you help me, Lord? And the Lord said, Go to the devil, and the devil was waiting. And I always think the part where the doing the bad thing is waiting for you all the time doing the good thing is the struggle but doing the bad thing the devil was just waiting he knew you were going to come and i think the right the temptation to be selfish to do the bad thing is always right there waiting and the good thing is the thing that you that you are trying to struggle and do and i think that's real and that's an idea that i had just from those little fragments of lyrics and the song is an old traditional song, so Nina Simone is where I heard it, but other people have done it too. And I, and you know, I don't even think Nina Simone ever knew where it came from, really. Uh -huh. it's a song, but um, but having that little scrap in my head and wanting to talk about that aspect of it, what had just for years been kind of burning in my skull, along with all the other things that are in this book, and so it was really fun to put them together. And I think that's what books are made of. <laughs> wait to read this book i'm so excited about it well thanks T. you're very welcome um what else do we got here um no. okay uh, in a series of unfortunate events i heard of that same yeah. what message did you want your readers to get from the phrase the world is quiet here hmm. Hmm. what message did i want i think that in a series of unfortunate events that 
the world there is made of books and literature, that libraries are often the, the driving force. There's a library in every volume of a series of unfortunate events in it. And that's where they, the Baudelaire's go for help and where help might come from. And, um, and I think libraries are a, a, an institution based on contemplation. And when you when and that's why you have to keep quiet when you're there because everyone's thinking it's not because like books are scared, and um, and I think thinking about a space where you can sit and think and where all of these things that you're interested in can come together can help you solve a problem and that's the solace that the Baudelaire's get from it. So that's what I think it is. That's beautiful. Okay. Um... What harsh truths do you prefer to ignore? Are clowns funny or scary? What would you sing at karaoke night? This is all one, one inquiry. Okay. If, you, if humanity was put on trial by an advanced race of aliens, how would you defend humanity and argue for its continued existence? Clowns and karaoke, obviously. Like, look what we've produced. Why right. would you yeah. destroy us? Yeah. All right. Um, do you have a go-to karaoke? Uh, kind of i've got a few um stevie nicks i really like her voice is kind of ragged right and that's good for me because i you know i'm often dehydrated right and singing trying to sing powerfully just worsens the problem yeah, likewise yeah. courtney love songs or whole songs are, are okay, good for yeah, me do that kind of yeah. raspy how about you uh for a long time i was stand by your man uh-huh <laughs> And I, because one thing that I liked was that every time I said stand by your man, I could move where I was just standing near like a, another guy. <laughs> so, there was an element of performance art. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, I mean, it's karaoke. So yeah. Um, also the Ghostbusters theme, because you can make everybody else say Ghostbusters and then you could just sing your own, you can sing the parts that aren't about Ghostbusters yourself. Yeah. <laughs> So sorry, what were the other parts of the question? Oh yeah, the advanced race of aliens. Well, clowns, funny or scary? Scary. As a the rule. Being scared is a little funny, I think. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, so it's not like they're not funny, but I think they're, n I think, I think it's the, I think they're startling. And I think yeah. that's. They're yeah. like absurd. So. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, but I mean, I think when you see, clowns making children cry you're not mystified by that yeah like, oh like, no i know what you mean yeah yeah they, they're like a long time ago i was walking a dog and the dog we walked by a building with a revolving door and the dog freaked out and i was like i get it i know like <laughs> never seen that before that's a weird thing yeah like why not a door really <laughs> so and i think it's the same thing when a child is crying with a clown you're not like but clowns are wonderful why ever would you cry you're like oh yeah no of course yeah that's they're crazy. just like their faces are nuts they're like larger than life they're yeah, yeah absolutely but, but but aliens um all right how would i defend the human race yeah how would we defend yeah. um i can't it's hard to imagine a scenario in which that would be my job mm -hmm. right where the human race was like we thought about who might defend us and It'll be Handler. That's a good choice there. I don't know. I actually would pick you. If I was, if I had to go through my roster of people that Is I know. Is it because I'm wearing a tie? It's because I'm wearing a tie. <laughs> you look respectable. Like they listen to you. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, no, you know why? Because like, because you've got a very broad sense of humor and that contains the like weirdness and sadness of being uh, alive and being human in it. Okay. So, I, just, I must admit, I don't like the dynamic of the premise of this question because an advanced race of aliens, that's what you said, right? It's yeah. already kind of little, you know, already the Wesleyan graduate in me is like picking that apart for its problematicness. <laughs> but um, because if they're really advanced, they're about to destroy us. That's what, that's the sign. Right. Of it. Yeah. I guess right. they're technologically advanced, but. Yeah. Um, and when you think not, about the history of colonization and genocide just on this planet, Right. It, should the dynamic be that all of the cultures that were being colonized or genocided should have had to defend them? So it should have been like, here's the reason why you shouldn't do this. It's like, no, you shouldn't do that because you shouldn't do it. Right. Yeah. So this is great. See, you would be perfect. You just flip the tables on them and yeah. you're just like, How you tell me why. Are you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you. That was fantastic. 
All right, and then we got we got one. I mean, there's so, we got so many great questions here. This is amazing. This is a zine project in itself. Yeah, Mr. Oh, mm, mm. Just saying. Maybe um, a collaboration ooh. with the lovely Miss T. That would be pretty fun. That would be really really fun. All right, we'll talk All about right. that. Yeah. Um, we, this is our final question, and it is: okay. How does one remember that humans are essentially good? How does one remember it? I mean, I think all of the things that we've been talking about. I mm -hmm. mean, um, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll close with a little bit. There's, there's a discussion of this figure in American history in Poison for Breakfast that, um, that fascinated me when I was a child. His name is Corla Pandit. And when I was a child, uh, he would come on TV every so often. A narrator would say, and now Corla Pandit, he's from India and he's bringing you the universal language of music. And then Corla Pandit would appear. It was black and white because it was like, and I think what happened is that the show was long since on, but my local TV show would throw it on if they had like 10 or 15 minutes to spare. Mm -hmm. They would throw it on and I would see it every so often and I would be totally uh, mystified and hypnotized. And he would came on in a turban and he would play the organ and he would not say anything. And, um, and I just kind of, uh, that was a thing that I liked to watch, but I didn't really think about it for a long time. And then as I grew older, I said to myself, I bet that guy is not from India playing the universal language of music, right? Like there was just, and he actually had a tiny little comeback in the nineties. You can see him in mm -hmm. that movie, Ed Wood, that Tim Burton meant. Uh -huh. like, when there was kind of like, remember when punk music kind of got interested in lounge music? Yeah. You know, so he, so he got, he came back a little bit and I bought one of his records then. And, but I was still like, now I'm feeling a little like, this isn't as cool as I thought it was. Like, is he, he's impersonating something that I'm not, you know, when I was a child, obviously this wasn't something that I was thinking about, but I was like, older. I he was, was like, impersonating. Yeah. Okay. Well, I didn't get that. Okay. Well, I mean, I didn't know that then. They just said yeah. he's up handed, but I, but kind of the older I got, I thought, I don't think that man is like a mysterious silent man from India. And the phrase mysterious silent man from India needs some unpacking in a way that's not going right. to make us feel comfortable. Right. And, and then I, I tried to do a little research about him. There was hardly anything at all. And then finally there was, there was a documentary about him that came out a few years ago. He was an African-American man. They think he was the first African-American man to have his own TV show. The, the mm -hmm. history isn't quite exact on that, but, but if he's not the first, he was certainly one of the first. And um, he was married, he lived in Los Angeles. He was a, a, an organist and a, and a musician. And he, um, he was married to a, a white woman and one way that all of that could be done without, with less pain and suffering was to say that you were from India. Wow. And you could have your own TV show and mm -hmm. you could be kind of out and about with your wife and live um, a, you know, a life in which you were like kind of mysterious and alluring as opposed to hated. Mm -hmm. And it's really complicated to think yeah. about that. Yeah, it's super I mean, complicated. Yeah. It's not just like, that was culturally appropriative. It's like, no, there's a lot going on that had yeah. to do race and oppression and freedom. Right, and you begin to have this, I mean, nowadays I think the dialogue about such issues in inevitably ends on like, can we forgive him for this or can we not forgive him for this? Which I always think is weird. Mm -hmm. um, I always remember when I, I'm not digressing from a digression, but when I was in high school that once, this guy was when I was hanging out with some guys and one guy was like I'm never gonna forgive the clash for this album and um, one of the other guys said oh I was talking to the clash and they're really broken up about that they, they can't <laughs> believe that an American teenager is like never gonna forgive them they don't know what to do and I always think about that when people say like should I forgive this artist I'm just like oh I bet they're waiting on tenterhooks if to see if you forgive them <laughs> and particularly for someone like Coral Pandit who's no longer with us we don't have to think about whether we forgive him or not we can just <laughs> think about the space in which that occupies. But yeah. it's an example where um, he was doing the best that he could. And I think, he, and he did something. And and if you can go and look him up on YouTube and you can listen to his music and it is actually very alluring and very beautiful. It is the universal language of music. Um, you know, I don't think that it's uh, at all an, a, and, um, an accurate portrayal of uh, a certain slice of culture that has had too much mythology and yeah. fetishization placed on them already. And so that part doesn't feel good. But I think to think about the fact that even 
when somebody does these things that rub against us in the wrong way, that feel wrong to us, we know that there's something in there that was trying to be, that was good and generous. And I think he was a good and generous person. I think he wanted to bring the universal language of music to people who didn't look like him. And he found a way in which to do that. And, um, and that's an example where that it's, that is something that I can think of. And I hope that people hear this can think about that too and be reminded that people are good. Even though that is not the most shining example of how you should behave, <laughs> I think that you can remember that that like that it was a good person, that was somebody doing something good. Yeah, for sure. Oh wow, that's a great story. That's a great way to end this. Um, well, let's all unpoison for breakfast in stores now. Get it, get it, you guys. And there's autograph copies that can be gotten right now. There are. Uh, um, okay. During COVID, I started a lovely relationship with Booksmith where. They, uh, I live right near them. Um, mm -hmm. One of their booksellers, uh, usually on a Vespa, brings me some books and leaves them on my front porch and I sign them and I oh. make a cocktail that I put in a little jar and I put it with the books and they get picked up. And I wish I had relationships with all vendors that way. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Wow. Oh, I'm so uh, happy to hear about that exchange that I did not yet know about. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should be delivering books. Uh, I knew that was next. I knew that was <laughs> next. Nice work if you can get it. <laughs> oh, well, this has been wonderful. Um, thank you guys both so much. Congratulations, Daniel and Mr. Snicket. Um, and uh, Michelle, thank you for leading the conversation. Um, Such a joy. Thank you all for your wonderful questions. I hope this has been some help um, for all of those ontological issues. Um, uh, <laughs> um, if, if, if your question wasn't answered, we'll see what we can do about trying to get some answers for you. Otherwise, perhaps- Michelle and I will come visit you at home. <laughs> question wasn't answered. Yeah, Michelle and I will come visit. I was just going to say that, that all the answers are in Poison for breakfast. And um, okay. if, if you don't have the copy yet, just click through. Uh, That's probably a better it. thing to promise that the answers can be from <laughs> the sale rather than promising that Michelle and I will visit you. I mean, it, it is definitely like you visit them, Mr. Snicket. They're definitely getting a visitation from you. There you go. That's fair. Mm -hmm. it, poison for breakfast is something we can actually deliver. So um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you all so much. Um, take care and uh, be well. And um, hopefully we'll, we'll see you soon. Thank you again.